The Mayan story is one of unrelenting oppression and of a persistence in surviving that oppression and seeking liberation that astounds me when I think on it. We were privileged to participate in Mayan spiritual ceremonies and to hear and read about the Mayan cosmovision. The Maya want to live their lives in a way that is fair and just with respect to Mother Earth, with respect to all other people, and with respect to all other life forms on land, in the sea, and in the air. Let me repeat that. They want to live their lives in a way that is fair and just with respect to Mother Earth, with respect to all other people, and with respect to all other life forms on land, in the sea, and in the air. A quotation from Lila Watson, an indigenous activist and organizer, comes to me again and again. Perhaps it's a response to my seeking. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. When I first read that quotation, I thought, whoa, what's this? My liberation? Who was talking about my seeking liberation? You're the one seeking liberation, right? Wrong. I learned what Lila Watson meant. On the trip this July, we visited a development project in northwestern Guatemala, a gold mine called the Marlin Mine. This is what a development project in Guatemala is from the perspective of a Canadian mining corporation, the World Bank, and the government of Guatemala. The government takes land away from its indigenous Mayan owners, forcing them to move without compensation. The mining company uses explosives to loosen the gold-bearing soil. Unprecedented cracks appear in the walls and floors of nearby houses. The company responds that the cracks are caused by seismic activity not their explosives. The company uses much of the water available in streams and springs, diverting it from traditional agricultural uses to mix with cyanide and ore to separate the ore from the gold, the gold from the ore. The cyanide-laden water then is trapped and held in ponds in perpetuity. Questions about the durability of these earthen ponds are met by claims of the seismic stability of the area. Did you catch that? Seismic stability for the cyanide ponds, seismic instability for the cracked walls and floors. The mining company doesn't recognize the inconsistency or the immorality. The Maya also complain about the rashes appearing on young children, the doubling in anencephalic births, uh, newborns without brains, and the company promising 10,000 local jobs and producing perhaps 1,800 at the lowest pay levels. People who complain about and demonstrate against any of these matters are subject to intimidation and worse. The night after we left San Miguel Ixtahuacan, the home of a woman active in the protest, let's call her Carmen, the, her home was invaded and she was shot in the head. I learned recently that Carmen survived and that she has returned home for a slow recovery. The company projected the mine would provide a generous return with gold selling at under $200 an ounce. The current sales price of gold is $1,347 an ounce. So is there a need to seek liberation in this scenario? The Marlin Mine is run by Gold Corp, a Canadian corporation. 70% of the money invested in this and similar mining companies comes from U.S. pension funds. Gold mining companies' stock prices are skyrocketing. Our culture values gold above all else. Our values are expressed in terms of gold. Good is gold. The best competitor receives the gold medal. The standard for behavior is the golden rule. The best times in history are the golden eras. Gold is the standard by which success is measured. And sometimes now even failures with golden parachutes. Our culture's passion for gold causes us to do terrible things to people like the Maya of Guatemala who don't have the economic power to resist. We must seek to liberate ourselves from this passion. Carmen is seeking liberation, fighting for her liberation. 
She was shot because she speaks up against the wrongs perpetrated on her, her family, and her community by Gold Corp, the Guatemalan government, and the Guatemalans who are bought off by Gold Corp to assist their development. Carmen would deny being called a hero for what she does. She does it as an exercise of everyday ethics, not being able to live with herself if she does not do what she can for her children, family, and community. We give permission for mining companies to proceed with impunity in their exploitation of the people of Guatemala by observing the gold standard in our culture. Our challenge is to exercise everyday ethics that mirror Carmen's in our daily decisions. I don't believe there is any longer a functional difference between many local, national, and global issues. Phrases such as third world or two-thirds world promote an us-them mentality that is no longer relevant or appropriate in the time of transnational corporations, U.S. global involvement, and global trade. Decisions we make about investments, groceries, and jewelry affect individuals in Guatemala, as do our decisions about recycling an old computer instead of disposing of it. The valuable components that are recycled are those that need to be mined. I'm not advocating not consuming or not buying. Of course we're going to consume. We need to eat, heat our homes and all those other things and others need to earn a living by selling. What I'm advocating is applying everyday ethics to everything we buy and everything we throw away or recycle. I'll tell you that in the Wagenius family, coffee is still bought. But the only choice is between Guatemalan fair market light roast or dark roast. We thereby support the seeking of a Guatemalan farmer for liberation and our own liberation from complicity in oppression. And we won't be buying gold and jewelry or otherwise. Not that that's a big issue in our family, but now that we know, we can't. As to issues which our individual purchases cannot affect, we will do what we can to influence where our retirement funds are invested. Now I know that the people of McAllister Plymouth Church have come up with ways in the past to liberate ourselves from complicity in oppression. I've heard wonderful stories. However, Heidi and I reviewed the organization chart of the church just a few days ago, and I can't think of a unit within this church that, with discussion, could not find additional actions of liberation to pursue. In this story, I hear two people, two voices. Jesus assures me that if I ask, I will receive. If I seek, I will find. If I knock, it will be opened to me. And Lila Watson challenges me. If you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. It sounds harsh. It sounded harsh the first time I read it. It sounds harsh now. However, if we come only to help her, but do nothing to work on the causes of her oppression and lack of liberation, actions that are within our influence or control, then the help is meaningful only in the very short run. But if we change what we can in our lives to influence the many forces of oppression that come from our culture, and we work together with her to understand her life and our lives together, then we may both be liberated. Ask. Seek. Knock. God is speaking still. Can we hear? May it be so.